Good afternoon. Rick Thomas, host of Yachting International Radio's Yachting USA podcast. Today, we're coming from the top of the bend at the Palm Beach International Boat Show. And I'm really happy to have my friend, associate, partner in this industry, Bob Saxon, with me today. Bob, welcome to the show, and thanks for sitting in with us. Rick, thanks for setting up such a nice venue for our interview, overlooking the Palm Beach Boat Show and all this great stuff. The weather's good. Today it is, yeah. Today it is, so we're in a good spot. Yeah, I might have, I'm tempted to turn the camera around, but not. But we are seeing a gorgeous view. We're, We're at the top of the bend, and we see the show laid out right below us, about eight floors down and about 200 meters away, and it's just it, the docks are full. There's there's some space for no more boats. It's it's exactly everything you'd want. Yes, it's very impressive. And from what my board of directors tell me at EBA, that as a result of the success of the Miami Boat Show, which turned out to be a really good boat show, I understand, everybody was buoyant with what was going to be happening here. And a lot of folks were saying they've had more customers coming into town for this boat show than they've seen in years. Love it. So I think we've turned the corner and we're back on the rebound. And yeah. Well, you brought up EBA, which is important for those that don't know. EBA is Yacht Brokers Association, International Yacht Brokers Association. Let me be clear about that. They're a sponsor of this venue we're in, the best, is Robert Allen Law. Bob Allen was yes. gracious enough to host this venue again. And so we're really privileged to be here with their benevolence and their sponsorship. It's we great. Do the, we do this as a membership benefit. So if you're a member of EBA, when you're in the show with clients or you want to take a break and come on over and see us over at the bend, there's no better venue with Bob Allen and the collaboration between Eva and that's been a successful thing over the years. Bob Allen's been very good to our association. He has. And let me be clear, this is something that I don't think a lot of people are aware of. I am not a yacht broker. I've never gotten my li- the yacht broker's license. I don't think that's in my vision for the future. But I have been a long-term member of Eva. I find it very valuable to be part of the association And it is a great way to engage with this industry. And for those who've started following this podcast, that's what this is all about. This isn't about the fluffy stuff and the pretty white boats and the pretty girls in the bow and all the beautiful interiors. This is about, I know, (laughs) hate to disappoint you, Bob, but that's not happening. Not yet anyway. I don't see it. But this is the nuts and bolts of the industry. Yes. And I'm at that point in my career where I'm looking for ways to bring focus to our industry and identify what's right and what's good, what's challenged, what could be fixed, what needs to be fixed. There's so many moving parts, so many facets of this industry, and so much of it has, in my opinion, matured, become more of a industry rather than a cottage business, like I think it was when you and I were early in the industry. Well, I think I was earlier than you, but yes, go on. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you might be me by a couple oh, years. You're really by an age factor. Okay. Yeah. So. so, so yeah. So here we are today talking about what was and, and where we've come from and uh, eventually, hopefully where we're going to go. Where, where, where's this industry going and what are the people in young professionals in yachting, YPY, what are they seeing? Where, where are they going to take us in the next decade or two? Well, the industry has evolved, and I've been in an advantageous position to, be, to observe it. And it used to be that the yacht purchase agreements might be signed on a cocktail napkin at Chuck's Steakhouse on 17th Street Causeway. And it was a very casual gentleman's game and all that. But out of necessity, it's evolved to be becoming a very sophisticated business. And EBA lends itself toward professionalism and ethics and also creating a Eliminating barriers to trade for the for our membership, not just the yacht brokers and selling boats, but anybody who works or become, is a member of EBA can also realize the benefits that we're trying to get things out of the way so people can do business here. And all that. So, right on. But YPI, YPY, the Yippers as I call them, uh-huh. and I do a lot of mentoring with those folks. As do I. Can, can expect is a much more sophisticated industry, but also an owner attitude. That has changed over the years. At one time, in other words, how do you market yourself in today's market and all that? Because it's not the same as it was 10 years, 15, 20, 40 years ago. Right. And it used to be ostentatious was the name of the game. And the bigger the yacht, the more cool you were. And you would sit on the back of your yacht in Monaco and uh, sip your tea and wave to the little people on the docks. 
It's all changed now. All that old money is out of it. And all the heirs to the fortunes now have a completely different attitude about what yachting's all about. They're much more, they're closer to the environment. Yes. They think of nature as their playground. And they're also, how they, the experience that they have on the yacht is completely different than what their parents and grandparents or whatever used to experience. So it's a much more active customer and consumer. And, but again, get all into the environment, all to preservation of the seas and conservation and so on and so forth. So when our brokers go out and start to discuss these deals with their clients, they take all this new buying attitudes into consideration. As it's should. not just the way it used to be. Biggest yacht, right. coolest yacht. Look what I've got. Look what you got. You're smaller than I am, so I'll build one. You'll build one bigger than mine. So it's all changed over the years. Yeah, and it's kind of refreshing to see that change. I, I was going to take us down that path, and, and, and I think we'll, we're, we're going to circle back around to that a little bit because you and I both have uh, both a love for the environment and the ocean. We grew up with that. That's why we're here. We also both are strong supporters of the International Seakeeper Society, and I know you've recently taken a, a little uh, junket with them, and uh, we'll talk about that. But I, before we get there, I wanted to go back just a little bit because there's another organization you and I have both been very active in. I was a member of the Super Yacht Society back when Ray Cattell was president of the society. Yes, and I was, I, I did not know what I didn't know in this wonderful world of yachting. I was a neophyte. I was like 28, 29 years old. My business had just gotten started. And somebody had suggested, it might have been actually Doug Sharp suggested that I get involved with the industry. And I jumped in with the Super Yacht Society. Well, Ray Cattell and Doug Sharp are two big names that you can drop, okay? They're legendary <laughs> characters, and they were there at the beginning. And uh, fantastic guys who put their time and effort and dedication and all their energies into the formulation of the Super Yacht Society. And I'll never forget the first day that a group of people met on board a commercial boat at the Fort Lauderdale Boat Show 30 blank years ago. Yep. And you had Mike Kelsey Sr. and Cattell and Ed Sachs, and all these industry principles. And some would say me. I happen to be there, too. And yeah. by default, they elected me founding president of yes. the International Super Yacht Society, whose mission remains to be the betterment for everybody in the yachting industry to do business, okay? That is it's the clearest and most pure mission that you can have. And there aren't many organizations in the world that can say that they do that on behalf of all. That's with right. No personal gain for any individual within the board or whatever, nope. but all for the benefit of all. And it's been a fantastic good night. And you've been a welcome addition to the organization. Well, well. And I, I hope I set a little bit of an example because there's a, I think there's a little intimidation factor for new people coming into the industry because it's a different kind of place in space you work in. And I know when I came in and, and these of course, these big white boats were awe inspiring. I came from commercial maritime, so it was completely different. And I was kind of making my way on my own, trying to figure out how it looks. And I got involved with the Super Yacht Society, which eventually renamed itself the International Super Yacht Society, if you recall. Yes. And that gave me access, I think, and I think that's important, access to people that were willing to help you out and introduce you to other people that could help you with whatever it was you were trying to accomplish. And th that is the part that a lot of people don't really understand about how our industry works. Our industry works because of personal relationships, business relationships, long time, long term, long view of uh, business. But it's not an industry you get in and not get out quick, get rich quick. It's a it's an investment that you put in and what you put in, you get out. Yes. And in the Super Yacht Society, you have no other place has a membership comprised. Like, look, in the Opera Open Association, former president of the Opera Open Association, mammoth membership, principally concerned with the efforts of brokers, although the Opera Open, although we do extend to all of our other members benefits as well. But with the Super Yacht Society, there's nowhere, nobody that can claim a membership comprised of builders, designers, architects, interior stylists, and all the other ancillary services and products right. that are involved in the Super Yacht Industry, all in one group, all in one spot at one time with a board of directors that's very impressive. So if you go on and look at the Super Yacht Society um, website, take a look at the people that are on this board of directors. 
years. Yeah. And then you have emeritus, myself, Norma Treese, Michael Moore, those folks that are there by guidance. And be, be like a, an oracle that we that they can come to and ask for advice moving forward and all that. Right, right. So it's been a fantastic experience. I'm very proud of the Super Yacht Society, International Super Yacht Society, yes. what we've done over the years to help our industry. As you should be. I sat on the board early. I was frankly surprised that I was elected to, to join the board so early in my career. Yeah, I might have been by default. <laughs> everybody hey, else, someone's willing to everybody do else stepped back and you were still standing. <laughs> oh, I didn't get the memo, but that was good. And then I rejoined about four, three years ago, four years ago, and I'm really enjoying the, the, the re-engagement of the association and the society. And I, I will continue to uh, invest my time and energies as long as they'll have me because I think it's worth it. I think it's something that matters. Yeah. And it, from the, everybody appreciates you. You have more energy than most folks. And you happen to be on my task force. You and me and Sylvia and uh, Melissa are on the task force that are set out to make sure that this year's gala yeah. at the Fort Worth Boat Show is seamless, effortless. It runs perfect and all that. So we're even going to get Gorilla's T-shirts for our team. <laughs> I love it. Right, We're in the yeah. process right now of picking our MC and a co-MC for this. Yeah, thing. we were talking about that at the board meeting this morning. Yeah. And uh, I think we volunteered Abby. I think Abby. we have. Yeah. Abby and Bert, my yep. guy. Yeah. And Bert uh, said, well, I don't know. I said, look, yeah. you're the guy. You're the guy. Yeah. Now, so. Bert was on the other side of this microphone a couple about a week or so ago. And wonderful gentleman to yeah, talk he to. Yeah, he is. It's quite a... His energy is yeah, infectious. Perfect. Thank you. Yep, That's yep. exactly what I was reaching for. <laughs> exactly what I was reaching for. So so you touched on the mentoring part, too. You and I both do some of that now. And I remember yep. two years ago, really coming out of this boat show, a couple months after, I had uh, started a refit project with the Octopussy. Ended up moving away from there because I got a phone call to start the U.S. Uh, division of JMS Yacht and Yacht yes. Management. Remember this? And yeah, so you and I sat down at Capitol Grill together and had a wonderful mentoring set, which really kind of put me on track to get my head around how I was going to start and build that company in, here in the United States. Now, I had a great support by everybody in Europe and couldn't have done it without them for sure. But we went from zero name recognition to well branded yes, in, in a year and a half, brought nine boats into the fleet where we hired three, three really remarkable employees and very, and really, competitive, very competitive market too. it is it is it's not easy i learned that for sure and what's interesting is her magni and i are revisiting that whole yes. process and so yeah. we're going to come out with our own thing and we'll be doing some more mentoring together i'm sure about cool. <laughs> cool. no i love mentoring i mean i think most folks know that 40 years ago 40 years ago think about i it. was well right out of college i taught high school coached baseball in high school yeah. And uh, so those uh, skills that I learned standing in front of a group of people and trying to convince them of a concept, most of those people in my classroom were probably smarter than I was, but I was still able to convince them of what I, what my thoughts were. So I'd be able to take those skills that I learned in those days to be able to bring it to the practical reality of the situation. I have a couple of mentees that you know, FHG and, and marine engineering. And it's a nice firm. and, and it's a good they, company, yeah. Yeah. And when they, and Katie and Richard first came to me, it was a matter of we're kind of like in this situation that we don't know really where to go. And that's perfect. Right. And they were in the process of trying to figure out whether they should or whether uh, they should not, uh, for example, buy a partner. So I walked into the whole process of buying out partners because I always believe, look, did you ever think about having a partner? Forget about it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, we can go down that rabbit hole so deep that we wanted to, Bob. So uh, I yeah. work with them. And now I'm so happy to say there was a three-person firm at that time. They're up to about 15 people now. And all I'm working with them now is managing growth. Right. How to manage growth, but at the same time be able to provide uh, service. Don't lose on your uh, service level because you're adding more people and spread yourself too thin and all that. So they're, they've been great to work with. And I have a couple of folks that I'm also mentoring as far as where do I go in my career? I don't know where to go. I don't know where to take it. And so that stuff all comes like natural to me. And I can hopefully give them good advice, and not yeah. get them in too much trouble. Not too much. Well, if they listen to your advice, they're probably they're, they're going to be fine. It's just a matter of yeah, making those good decisions. So I want to go back to something that we share in common, and that is the love of the ocean and the support of the International Sea Keeper Society and similar initiatives Four Oceans, another good example of a company that's actually actively trying to do something positive 
But you and I have this in common with, with the international seakeepers. And uh, tell me about this trip you just did to Costa Rica, because that sounds fantastic. Well, let me take it back to the genesis to the beginning of this thing. And what happened was I was moderating a panel discussion between folks that showed up at a char- one of our charter seminars and were on a panel. And these were all destination sponsors. Bermuda, Belize, Costa Rica, Panama, and a Turks and Caicos and all that. And they all got up and I ran the panel discussion and they all put their dog and pony show on. And then I said to them at the end of the panel discussion, I said, I hate to disappoint you. I said, but do you think just coming here and throwing a bunch of a beautiful slideshow up there for all that automatically all kinds of yachts are going to divert themselves from the mainstream and come down here to your uh, destination. No, you have to create a market for that. Right. Well, so I worked out, I was engaged by uh, Costa Rica, the Enjoy Group, to especially focus on Marina Pajillo Gofito. And the, I, my idea in going there was to write them a business plan right, on how to create more yacht, nautical tours over yachting traffic and all that. But when I got there, I realized, on my own, they brought me down on two trips down just to take a look around. I soon realized there was multi-layer. There's much more to it than just simply saying, let's create a yachting destination. Let's create a charter destination. Because of the biodiversity, and the cultural, of the heritage in, in, is regarding ocean conservation, the rainforest, the whales, the hammerhead sharks, the, all these experiences needed to, and, and the, the government is dedicated to conservation, not only of the oceans, but the rainforest as well. Isn't that so important? So I decided, and we did a couple of fam trips, we brought some charter brokers down, and the idea was to charter brokers and charter managers as influencers as to where their clients would go and ultimately maybe lead some of their customers to bring yachts down. However, we tied, I tied immediately into the conservation. And so recently, as you were just alluded to, it occurred to me that a good group to bring down there or to engage with would be Seakeepers. That's right. And so I made contact with Michael Moore and Jay Wade, the chairman of the board, Norma, and persuaded them that they should get themselves on down to Marina Bahia Golfito. And I will never forget Michael Moore, because I would have Bob, coffee with Bob every morning at the La Playa restaurant, sitting out there, overlooking this magnificent scenery. Right. And that's so, so slowly but surely, people started coming down and having good, rich Costa Rican coffee. Are you kidding me? At 7 a.m.? In this incredible environment, Mother Nature was sitting right there alongside you. And we, Michael Moore said to me, I've never in my entire life sat anywhere in all the world, in all my yachting experience, in a scene like I'm looking at right now. Wow. And, and I had another conversation with Michael Moore last night, as a matter of fact. And this is going to be the, this engagement between Sea Keepers and the Enjoy Group, which incidentally, Rick, resulted in the signing of a, of a memorandum of understanding that on a goodwill basis, we will go forward and explore the resources of both the Enjoy Group, Marina Bahia Golfito, and all their other facilities that are immersed in Costa Rica, yeah. and the Super Yacht, I mean, the Akit Sea Keepers. And, and they are so enthusiastic that they're looking into possibly, for example, having a grant kind of a program where they send scientists, ocean scientists and such, to Golfito. And the Gofito will host them there and because they're building a research facility dedicated to the oceans and the rainforest. So this all this whole engagement was so perfect. It was so like partners and so individually capable That's partners of, the of, magic. of, of being, exploring each other's resources. So that was a big deal. That was yeah, a real big that, deal. That's the magic. Yeah. So I like to connect dots and everybody who listens to podcasts knows that I'm that's part of what I'm all about, connecting the dots. And there's a whole bunch of dots here to connect because Several weeks ago, Mike and I sat down, Michael Moore and I sat down. We talked for an hour and a half, turned into three episodes. It was great. We talked a lot about Seakeepers in the third episode because of our mutual collaboration and, and appreciation for the organization. Bert Files and I spoke last week and we talked about destinations and you know what it takes to build the infrastructure to attract the yachts and to attract the owners that they will come and stay and give them something to come to. And that's really important. 
And then Sea Keeper Society last weekend, I had I had their newest science director on board, Haley Davis, who just joined with them. We had a scientist that came over from Sarasota who's doing research about it's like a swimming mollusk, it's like a sea snail away without shell, that grows in the Gulf of Mexico, gets caught up in the Gulf Stream. Sea turtles eat them, and, and there are in species about how things are going as far as invertebrates in the water. That's part of the whole health of the ocean. So we went out 26 miles on my little 10-meter boat, which is the, I believe, the smallest discovery vessel in the Sea Keeper fleet. I get that <laughs> distinction, but we use it that we use it for that purpose a lot. And we were collecting samples, and I actually did an interview with Haley, which will come out this weekend. Fantastic. So we've got Sea Keepers tied into IGY marinas talking about destinations and and Michael Moore talking about sea keepers. And here you and I are talking about all this. And this is what it's really all about, I think. How is, if you get out of your lane just a little bit and start looking around what interests you and try to pay attention to what's kind of important, you'll find opportunities to engage and do well for others. If we don't do something to preserve our oceans and our lakes and our rivers and other waterways and all that, there's no need for boats. Exactly. It, that's it. And so that, that is from a like a industry preservation uh, standpoint, that's what we need to do in order to, to continue to engage our clients who want to go down. Remember, I said earlier that now the clients, prospects, the owners of yachts are into nature and exploring. And that's, of course, the basis for the conversation that the original conversation we had at Marina Bay El Capito was that let's try to divert these owners who and or charter clients, for right. example, if you're creating a charter market, to want to see and experience all of these wonderful things. And when we went down and we chased the spinner dolphins, as you referenced, yeah. and we chased the whales and we watched the tuna getting into the sardines and the spinner dolphin were right behind them and the orcas were right behind them. <laughs> and it goes on and on, this life cycle. And it is like this, it's like an aquarium down there. It's so- like you have your own multi-hundred mile aquarium because they also own Costa Rica also owns Cocos Island yes which even though it's 300 miles offshore because they own Cocos their territorial limitations go 200 miles even further than that Bravo. so it's all this ocean yeah. and all these fisheries and all these uh, nurseries for fish and all that that they're out to preserve and that is on behalf it's not something I started that's on behalf of the government the government is absolutely dedicated to preserving nature land Rainforest and the ocean. Yeah, and that's so important. If you go farther south and see what the government of Brazil is allowing, or even a little bit north of Costa Rica, what uh, Nicaragua is doing, that's right. and Panama is doing, and, and their, their natural resources are being plundered, and that stuff. Somebody was telling me that the Turks and Caicos are still fished out. Now, I don't know this. I don't mean to guess this person. Somebody told me that the Turks and Caicos are so fished out that the fish, now, when they hear a small boat coming, they scatter. They, they take off. Yeah, they scout. Yeah. They learn. Okay, <laughs> yeah, they look around. Hey, where's everybody? So yeah, they're, 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 they're fish aren't all that stupid. That's so that's sure. become a passion not only for me, but I think the industry has taken this passion into consideration as well. Now that's good. And I, yeah. I, I, I'm a, I'm a huge advocate for that. Look at that. We're looking past the camera here, but yeah. we can see it on the horizon. That yeah. big blue out there. So that's I, worth keeping. So you know what? I am <laughs> after we finish this, I'm going to turn this camera around, and I'm sure Ray will edit a little bit of this interview. So. You guys can see what we're seeing. We are seeing a just spectacular view. This is and this is a reminder of why we're doing what we're doing. Well, I have, to, I have to tell you all that Rick said earlier. Look, um, where we originally decided to meet Bob, that's not going to work. But I think that we can figure out a good place. I think that we have we, uh, found nobody's here. <laughs> the place to have interviews. And I think maybe this might host a few of your interviews in the future. Uh, this is this that just doesn't get better than this. Yeah. It doesn't get to a quiet little corner. I love it. Yeah. So, 800 pound gorilla in the room. Mm-hmm. I, I have to do this just because that's part of what we're doing here. Yeah. And that is what's happened to boat building North America. Yeah. And is there a solution? Where is there a place to go? I'm going to, for the benefit of people listening, I'm going to go back again. I've said this in previous uh, conversations, but when you and I started in this industry, I counted north of 45 shipyards in North America, U.S. and Canada, building crew-served yachts that'd be 75, 80 foot and larger. About 33, 34 of them were building over 100 foot. And today you can argue four or five left over. 
That's right. Four or five left over. I interviewed Daryl Wakefield yesterday. We had a great conversation. And, good and man. Yeah. He's, he is he's definitely one of the good guys in this industry. No question about it. Talked to Ron Clivering at Burger yesterday. We're on the record there. And these are two of the viable shipyards. Delta's the third that I would describe as a viable shipyard. Vikings got a robust boat building operation up in New Britain and New Jersey. They're fine. They build a few cruise, cruise serve vessels, not a lot. But what we see out here, predominantly are Italian, Northern European, German, and, and Dutch, and Asian boats with a sprinkling of some American built boats out there. I don't remember seeing any Trinities on the dock. There might be one or two, but I. As a matter of fact, I have an appointment on a Christian sim. Wow. In about 20 minutes. Okay. But, uh, so, so, so here's the question. Yeah. Knowing where we've come from, and we, I think you and I both can agree on some of the reasons why some of these shipyards have, have, have disappeared. But looking to the future, do you see a day where American yacht owners, high net worth individuals who are going to build a boat will go, some money into this yard with a buddy of mine, we'll build two and scale it and bring our resources back to the United States, or have we lost that forever? I don't know. I'll tell you what. Let me expound on that just a little bit. I was president at the IYC, and the IYC was owned by Trinity. Right. Of course, Trinity built over 60 yachts, probably more than that. 63 that I'm aware of. 63 yachts, over 150 feet, and so. And they were a vibrant shipbuilding, a yacht building operation, as was Christensen, as was Delta. Now Delta's still there. Delta Delta still does their thing one or two a year and all that. And Burger, they put out fine product. Burger does and all that. What happened was... You may have heard me talk about this before. There was a swing in the attitude toward wealth in the United States at one point, where at one time, wealth was an admired thing. And the Horatio Alger rags to riches a story. Everybody admired that. And politically, the spectrum began to change and came out of focus, where our uh, political administration started Blaming all the ills of our uh, on the tax. wealthy people. Right. Luxury tax. The yeah. failed luxury tax. How horrible was that? That was horrible. So that's, it became a cause, common cause for common people. Oh, these rich people, they're not paying their fair share and blah, blah, blah. So but you've got an individual, a guy or a gal who wants to build a big yacht. And at that time, Trinity had this supply line. It was unbelievable how they were punching them out. Oh, it was great. And Christensen to a certain the Christensen to a certain extent as well, and Hatteras and Berger and all of our good deltas and all that. Yeah. But when the attitude toward wealth changed, the Americans who were going to build yachts decided, I'm not going to build it here in the United States. And some people would say, well, there's a little less pedigree if you build it here. Then but I'm not so sure I believe that. I'm not so sure I believe that either. Yeah. Uh, but so the, the individual who might build a 200 foot yacht, he lays off a couple hundred people. He doesn't want it known that he's building a $200 million yacht someplace. Right. So, and I talked to at that time, Tim Hamilton was with Fetch It. And I, I said to Tim, I said, how many, I'm talking about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, I said, how many. Have you gotten a pipeline and fed you? And he said, 17. Nice. And I said, how many Americans? And he said, well, I really can't tell you. And I said, oh, come on. And he goes, 12. Uh-huh. So yeah, here's 12 percent. Americans. Yeah. Here's 12 Americans going overseas to Italy or the Netherlands or Germany or wherever to build instead of building here. And one thing I want to make, I want to make a comment about this. Billy Smith who was a very dear friend of mine and was the guy that I reported to when Trinity owned IYC. Yep. Billy Smith said, building a yacht is the greatest redistribution of wealth man has ever known. You put 500 people to work for five years, <clears throat> they go back into their communities and spend what they've earned. And then five years later, when the yacht gets delivered, it becomes this mammoth consumer of luxury goods. Right. And every port it goes of, into. Because you and I have been in the management business. We paid the bills. Yes, we, we have. We know how much they <laughs> And it's pretty impressive. I've had brokers call me and say, hey, Rick, can you tell me what the operating cost for a 50-meter yacht is going to be per year? Yeah. Because it's one of those things. You so have to, you have to is, know it. Is there hope and promise? Yes, of course there is. Hope springs eternal within the human yard. But it's got to be a, a president that has such leadership qualities that business, it becomes paramount as far as the objectives, okay, of the administration are concerned. 
And that doesn't mean business in terms of taxing the wealthy. That means business in terms of eliminating barriers to trade, such as the attitude toward wealth, and, all, and also not pinning all the ills of the world on wealthy people. Right. Because they aren't. And it's just a popular thing for people to talk about. That they're the problem. They're blamed for all our problems. So. so let me go touch that third rail real quick. Okay. Trump gets elected. We petitioned Trump to put a presidential yacht back in service, and he builds another Trump princess. That would send a message. Sure. Would. <laughs> sure. Would put I can't Trump remember speech. any president prior to that. Maybe JFK had the um, the Honey Fitz, yeah, which was the presidential yacht. But I don't remember the yacht owner who was president. <laughs> I we had a seminar one year, and Bob Dennison. This is eh, five or six years ago. Bob, and it happened to be during the election thing. And Bob Dennison had a panel of people up there who were all like big wheels, right? big deals, business owners or principals or CEOs from the yachting business. And at the end of his, at the end of his, there were 10 on his panel. Right. And Bob Dennison said, one more question. How many of you are voting for Trump? And all, <laughs> all 10 folks that were on that panel raised their hands and they were voting for Trump. Now, I'm not casting, I'm not trying to tell anybody what to do. All I'm saying is, as long as we have the, as long as there's this general attitude about the, the wealthy people being bad, yeah, then you're not going to see a rebirth uh, of yacht building industry. No, in the no, I think that's a real truth. Billy and I have had the same conversation, and I've had that conversation with so many people myself. It is the most profound way to redistribute wealth. You look at what it takes to build a, a, a Gulfstream G6. Yeah, you can customize the interior a little bit. But the aircraft is the aircraft, and it's automated in its manufacturing processes, and the number of man hours per dollar cost are small compared to the number of man hours per dollar cost of a yacht. It's bottom line. Yeah. And and you think about the economics. My company that I had nautical structures, at our peak, we had 108 employees yeah. supplying cranes and gangways to yeah. the yacht building industry. So think about that. That's just one little tiny piece. Sure. And we had that many people hired, and, and these were all living wages. We had we paid nobody minimum wage. It was skilled labor to yeah. do what we're doing. Yeah. So it is real that shipbuilding brings economic prosperity yeah. to those regions where they yeah. do it. And the Netherlands and Germany and Italy are prosperous in their shipbuilding industries right now. Yeah, and you guys were talking about this uh, yet, yet at the seminar um, yesterday, and about it also. It's it's employment. It's not only the employment of and, and the engagement with ancillary services, but and the, and the people who are building the yachts. And if you ever want to see something that's incredible, go to Westport Yachts and take a look at what they got going on out there. I mean, the number of people that are involved in the construction of the and creating this dream. Yes, people know it. But it's the crew as well. Yeah, and crew. And we talked about this, and it's a passion of yours, it's a passion of mine. And that is that it's a career that's provided to youngsters or folks that want to get into something that is like a, a perfectly defined career path to get at the entry level onto a yacht and work as a crew and do all those wonderful things that are associated. Yeah, there are rigors of working as a crew. Of but, course. But nonetheless, still, along with the building of the yacht comes the employment of the crew. And they, those should be more Americans working on those yachts. You know? Yeah. I, but, uh, I think there's a... a, a a factor of they don't know what they don't know. Right. There's a lot of kids that go off. We, in fact, at lunch today, we're having this conversation about the, the decision to go to college and get some liberal arts degree. Right. And then you get a job at forty or $50,000 a year with a college degree. And you're like, what do I do? Where you can come out of and, and get your SDCW and, and jump on a boat. And if you work hard three or four years, you'll get to the point where you're making some good money. And then you can get to six figures in five or six years if you are, are good at what you do. And then eventually you can rotate back to the beach and sure. and, and get involved. Well, if you, in the if, if you start out as a deckhand or something, they're paying you thirty two or thirty six thousand dollars a year or whatever. Well, it's like yeah. double the money. Yeah, because you just put that money in the bank. You have no rent, your know, uniforms, your food is taken right. care of. If you want to go ashore and blow it at a bar or something, that's one thing. But otherwise, that is it. And, and also, if you're on a charter boat, you're getting the cash tips. I say cash that. tips are very good. We yeah. won't tell them to see them about that. <laughs> uh, no, right. um, that, it's, it's just a wonderful career path. And I encourage anybody who ever thinks 
yeah. that they'd like to try something out there. If there, if there are any of those folks that are watching the podcast here that ever want to consider a career, look into it. Yeah, no. This is an unbelievable, it's the most resilient industry it is. that one can imagine. Dude, doesn't matter. COVID, we thought COVID was going to kill the yachting industry. I was right along with that oh. tune. And what happened? It, 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 it went we blew crazy. Up. Yeah, it got crazy. You couldn't find a yacht to buy. You yeah. couldn't find a charter yacht because people wanted to get away. Well, was there any better way to social distance than on board a yacht? Even and my own boat. It was it, wonderful. Affluent types, deservedly so. They're a firm for uh, working hard to make the money. They don't want to be deprived of their recreational pursuits. No. And, and so that's why we have such a steady and a, such a, a firm market. Because they'll always be out there. And so if there might be little dips and all that, but this is the, the most incredible business to be in I, that one can imagine. What a great way to end this, because that's exactly how I feel about it. I feel blessed to be in this industry. I feel blessed to have the friends I have, such as yourself, to be participating in this industry with me. Mm-hmm. What are we going to do for the second half? I don't know, but Rick is sure. I feel blessed to be, able to be here with you and shoot yeah. crap with you and all that kind of stuff. And anybody who's thinking about yachting, do Come it. On. Yeah. It is the most resilient marketplace one can imagine. Yeah. You'll enjoy it. You won't regret it. That's for sure. Fantastic. Well, again, Bob, thanks for joining me. Uh, Rick Thomas, host of Yachting International Radio's Yachting USA. And until the next time, I'm out of here. Bob Saxon Consultancy, let me know if you need anything. Good job. Good job. Put that in there. Thanks again, Bob. Yeah, sure enough. All right.